Um, today we are joined by Emma Warner. She has a master's degree from the University of Edinburgh, and she is going to talk to us about emotions in bottlenose dolphins um, and measuring that and how on earth we ask that type of question um, to a non-human animal. Um, your DCP team is here monitoring the chat, Nicole, Kathleen, and myself. And with that, I will pass this wonderful Earth Day presentation over to Emma. Thank you. I know what a day to have it on, right? Uh, Ready? We'll pass it to her. Okay. Lovely. So, <clears throat> so this is my this is my part of my master's research, and we were looking at whether we can actually recognize emotions in bottlenose dolphins. So as um, Kel said, how, how do we ask that kind of question? So the technique that we're gonna be looking at today or a particular way of assessing them is using something called qualitative behavioral assessment. So firstly, I just wanted to thank my co-authors and my collaborators for working with me on this and without their help it wouldn't have been possible so thank you to Francoise and Sabrina they can't be here on the call right now but um, I'm, I'm very grateful to them so yes absolutely wonderful uh, so why <clears throat> why did I want to do this piece of research as Cal mentioned I've done my master's degree at the University of Edinburgh that was in applied animal behavior and animal welfare now, before I did that, that was in 2017, 18, I understood that I really, really had a passion for dolphins. And I wanted to know how on earth we can give them the best lives possible that they can experience under our care. And at the same time as my master's degree, um, or at the time, I didn't know that that was actually what animal welfare was. So I sort of went on a bit of a journey and then I understood that this is what animal welfare was applied for my master's degree, and then the rest is history. <laughs> but at the time, um, Francoise was actually teaching me a method or a methodology that, was, that can be used to look at understanding emotions in other animals in a sort of more objective scientific way. Now, that initially was taught under the framework of what we call the welfare quality index, and what it is, is this is a large framework that's been developed with 12 different parameters looking at things like um, physical assessment, the environment that the animal's in, its body condition, um, all these behaviors, all these different things. So there's 12 different parameters. And also at the same time, because I was interested in dolphins, what I um, was also reading about at, um, alongside it was uh, a paper that had come out um, by Isabella Clegg about this, um, essentially taking the same parameters from the welfare quality index, but applying it to dolphins. So I thought this is all amazing and fascinating. And as I was reading through it, what I saw was that the very final parameter, the 12th parameter, which was looking at qualitative behavior assessment, actually wasn't featured in the Sewell one. So I thought, oh, look at that, there's a gap. Amazing. I've got the right person, the right supervisor to help sort of lead me through it. And I've got the right thing for dolphins. This is literally the perfect niche to try and do this research. So let's try, let's, let's try and work towards dolphin welfare that way for me. So one of the really important questions that we need to ask is why do we actually want to know what an animal is feeling? So one of the cornerstones, this is this is one of the cornerstones of what animal welfare science does um you know investigating how these feelings and experiences might occur in an animal's life the animal welfare science is often weighing up these positive and negative emotional states that an animal will be experiencing now in order to try and get positive welfare and and a good quality of life for an animal we want to ensure that these positive emotional states really do outweigh the negative emotional states. That's what we want to do. But it is impossible to eliminate all negative feelings from a life. You know, we know that things happen, things go bad, or things, you know, just, yeah, you know, things just happen. And, you know, what we want to do is we want to ensure that as we learn about these animal feelings and understanding more about their welfare, we can help, we can start to understand and adapt our own behavior to alleviate 
some of those negative feelings that an animal might experience, such as boredom or frustration or fear or pain or distress. And we also want to then learn how we can foster and facilitate those other positive emotions. So it's not when we talk about positive welfare, we're not just talking about experiencing happiness all the time. It's not about that. There's a whole breadth of emotion that's positive that we 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 need to experience as beings and that can be happiness but it could also be something like curiosity excitement willingness and and feeling bullish that kind of thing relaxation calmness and also resilience i've put that in there because that's you know when 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 an animal is resilient and and yeah resilient to stuff when things or you know when negative situations may arise or challenges occur they'll be able to cope with a better buffer so that those negative feelings don't suddenly override everything that the animal's feeling so this all leads to what we essentially want to call quality of life and within you know animal care you know looking after the animals that we've got the welfare of those animals is top priority. It's all about the animals. The animals come first. So you know, animal caregivers, they work day and night tirelessly to ensure that they can give the animals the best quality of life that they can. And quality of life often fits on a scale. And what we want to go for is, you know, we want to make sure that those animals are experiencing positive or they call effective states for the majority of their time you know whatever breadth of of positive emotions that those animals can experience we want them to experience that for the majority of the time that's what we would consider an excellent quality of life at the other end if they're experiencing too many challenges and their environment's not good enough and all of these other things that you know can contribute to negative feelings if those are outweighing the positive ones too much of the time or they're too significant, then that's what we would consider poor quality of life. So we don't want that, do we? However, there are some issues when, we can't, when it comes to talking about emotions in animals. Now, what we need to do is we need to be very critical when we do this, we need to approach it scientifically and as objectively as we can. What the problem is, is that with animals, we can never possibly know what they're actually feeling or experiencing because you know, when we talk to another human being, we, we understand what they might be feeling, not because we can see it straight away, but because we're able to communicate it and we can understand and process that communication. So if I'm saying to, you know, Kathleen, you know, I can't see her on a video right now. Hold on, where is she? Oh, she's, <laughs> she's, she's, she's on her um, thing. Kathleen, show me, there you are. Okay, so <laughs> at the moment you're looking, you know, I can say you're looking pretty, I don't know, confused. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe a little excited, maybe happy. Um, but I can only confirm that if you tell me how you're feeling. At the moment, we, let me just turn you off that, hold on. That's how we do it in humans. Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't speak dolphin. So what, what we can be in danger of if we don't approach this scientifically is projecting our own feelings onto another animal. And that is something that we want to avoid. That is called anthropomorphism. And it is not what we want to do. It is not necessarily very helpful. And what can happen is it can lead to decisions being made about how to look after animals based on what we feel is best for them, not necessarily what is best for them based on science and evidence. And if we do that and we maybe inadvertently misinform policymakers and legislators, what that can lead to is actually harming the welfare of the animals that we care about. And we really do not want to do that. So given all of that, then how on earth do we actually do this? Um, mm -mm. So 
we can start, well, we, as I said, we have to be critical. You can't just go around assuming animals are feeling certain things because that doesn't help anything really. We need to use data and evidence to build a nice pretty picture that we can then launch off to then be able to start describing emotions in a more scientific way. So what we can first do is we can look at animal brains. So you know, we can pick apart a brain, whether, that, whether that's a dolphin brain or you know, a general mammal brain and see how all the different pieces connect together and what the different functions of those areas are. That's all very interesting and it helps lead us into the next thing, which is gathering data. So we can then look at things like behavior. You know, what are the animals doing? Are the animals feeding? Are they being social? Are they mating? Are they doing things like problem solving? Are they showing aggression? Are they showing stereotypies? Are they being abnormal? These are all really important things to understand and recognize what they look like. The next thing, we can look at cognition. So how an animal processes information, you know, how do they problem solve? What, you know, how, how do they communicate with one another? And I think for me, what's, what, what's important to relate this back to emotion is whether we can understand or see whether animals have the capacity to understand the emotions that they feel. So we know that when we experience pain, we understand that we're in pain and we can um it, we can contextualize it and we can you know it, it 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 fits in and makes sense within our environment so we need to understand basically whether that can happen in animals um and then the next thing as well we can look at their physical health so is the animal ill is it injured are they going through, you know, what's their hormonal cycle like? You know, all these things have an impact on how an animal behaves at any given point. Um, you know, often when we see, say, you know, your, your pet or your dog that's you know, behaving in a certain way, if you see something that's not quite right or they're behaving in a way that's not quite as normal as they would be, you question it and you think, oh, maybe something's not quite right with them. And then maybe you take them to the vet if you can't physically see something on them. Um, you know, so the, so emotions can really serve as important markers for us to then ask further questions. So given that in mind, we can actually sort of work backwards. So we can take this sort of missing element to what their emotions are and then ask some questions, which is what I'll be going through shortly. And then we can piece it back together, fitting in all of the understanding that we have about their behavior, cognition, health, etc., to try and understand what they're feeling. So if that all makes sense so far. So what we're doing, so this particular method that we're using to assess emotions is called qualitative behavioral assessment. And what this is, is it's a more holistic approach to looking at the whole animal as a being, as a living, breathing, moving being. Now, what we want to do is we want to look at describing their body language. We're looking at the expression of the behavior that they're, that they're doing. So it's not looking at the, it's, it's looking at the how and the style of their behavior, not exactly what it is that they're doing. So I've got a little example here. So, okay. um, we can see if, if you're just looking at the, the black and white of it, you know, both of those dogs are playing with a ball. But you can see immediately the differences in how they're playing with the ball. The dog on the left looks pretty shy, maybe quite timid, a little uncertain. The dog on the right, I've got no idea, looks <laughs> a little excited, um, maybe quite focused. You can't tell everything just from still pictures, but these are just quick illustrations of what we can, what we can see. Um, but generally, so QBA. It's effective in itself to be able to help describe the emotions, but in terms of applying it to welfare assessment, it's got the most impact when it's combined with the physical, and the behavioral and the environmental assessments that go along with it. So which species so far have been looked at with QBA? It's been done in quite a lot of animals, which is really awesome to see. So as a technique, it's been validated a number of times um, so 
it originally kind of came out of livestock and farm animal agriculture. So, you know, animals like pigs, poultry, cattle, sheep, goats, and also donkeys. So working equids. Also, a lot of the time with companion animals. And this is particularly interesting when um, you'll see with like uh, shelter dogs. Um, we can all we can basically look at the differences. Um, Q, basically QBA can help with understanding and picking apart how animals fare emotionally in different types of environments. So shelter house dogs versus non-rescue animals or um, looking at different housing environments for livestock. And also more recently, looking at human animal relationships with zookeepers. Um, so there's been studies in giraffes and elephants and then also um, a lot more recently with dolphins as well. So it's really exciting. It's sort of an up and coming time for, for marine mammal welfare science. It's a really exciting time to be doing it. So um, yeah, this is my <laughs> thesis that was magically turned through lots and lots of hard work and patience into a research paper that's now hopefully um, under review. But the aim of this was to, we, we had three aims from this paper. And the first one was to apply this QB aim and <clears throat> basically see whether a group of, observe, group of observers, sorry, can agree on what they see as dolphin expression from videos that they'll be showed. And then we'll also be looking at behaviors of the dolphins that they're actually watching and see whether they, whether those behaviors themselves actually correlate with the um, expressions or the, the descriptions that the observers have come up with. And then thirdly, do any of the correlations that we come up with help us understand or support the literature on dolphin behavior? And do they tell us something about dolphin emotional expression? Those were the aims of our paper. So what we had was we had 36 different dolphins um, across two different locations. We had a whole range of ages, <clears throat> Of, of those animals and um, they were housed in different types of environments. Uh, so we had some which were sick, um, single sexed groups, we had mixed sex groups, um, some were outside, some were inside, all very varied, which meant that we had lots of emotional expression and variation to choose from. So then what we did, um, I, well, I went around and recorded lots of the animals in different scenarios. So we had um, videos of animals in training sessions, and we also had videos of animals being provided with different enrichment devices um, outside of training. And then we also had videos of dolphins just doing their thing in their dolphin free time. So what we did <clears throat> as well, so uh, I collected about 21 different clips that then these were showed to the different observers and each one of them was between one and two minutes long. And we had a mix of um, videos that were filmed above the water, as you can see in that top um, photograph, and then also sort of through the glass, you can see below the water as well. So what we have here is, so QBA can be done using different types of methods and, and, and different ways of, of looking at behavior. But this particular method was used, was, was um, applied using something called free choice profiling. And it's a technique that my supervisor Francoise actually came up with. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And it's a, basically a way where observers can use um, their own words to, dis to describe something's quality. And it originally came out of food science in the 80s um, <clears throat> through sensory analysis of consumer products. So things like Test, you know, when people test um, flavor profiles of things like coffee or chocolate or like even water these days. Um, but that's what it kind of comes out with. Uh, well, that's where it sort of originally came from. And Francoise, what she did was that she, she used the same technique of free choice profiling and adapted it so that you can use it to apply um, the same form of measurement to looking at expressions in animals, which was really, really, really cool. 
Um, <clears throat> so how do we actually go about doing this in the experiment? So what I did was, excuse me, I'm very all croaky. So we had 10 student observers and let's see, um, seven of them actually came directly from my MSc and um, there were three additional PhDs, but they all had knowledge of animal welfare and they all had knowledge of um, animal behavior. So they all kind of understood the topic. They were all pretty happy with what was going on. They also were familiar with QBA as a concept and understood the principles of free choice profiling. So it wasn't a completely alien concept to them. Um, so that's quite helpful. But none of them had any specific knowledge of dolphins or dolphin behavior. So they were all naive observers in that sense. Now what we did, so we had two different sessions. So the first session, all the observers sit down and then they're watching the videos of the different dolphins doing their thing. And they're given <laughs> paper and they have to basically write down as many different types of adverbs and descriptive terms to describe the dolphins that they can. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So that was in the first session. So it's called term generation. And then in the second session, um, I had to sort of do some magic and flip it all around. And then for each individual observer, they all had their own individual terms. I needed to create a, a sort of individual scoring pack for each observer. So when they sat down in the second session and watched the same videos again, they all had the list of terms that they had individually written for themselves in front of them. And they were given what we call, let me grab my uh, laser pointer here, hold on. Mm -hmm. There we go. So um, they, were, they were given what was called um, a visual analog scale. And, um, uh, and when they were asked to go through their list of terms, they then um, were asked to measure how, say, for example, they're watching a dolphin, they think it's relaxed. Um, they want to tell us how relaxed do they think that dolphin is? So the maximum would be this dolphin could not be more relaxed. It could not be more chill at this moment in time. Or at the other end, they could say it maybe is a little bit relaxed, but it's not that relaxed, but it looks kind of relaxed, that kind of thing. So they then quantified all of their terms. So those were the two sessions that we had for those observers. Next, what we wanted to do was look at the behavioral side of it. So what the act show, this is what the, the observers didn't have anything to do with this. This is what I was doing. So for each of the clips, I went through and collected, well, I created an ethogram and um, <clears throat> which avert your eyes momentarily, <laughs> you'll see why. Um, had 37 different um, behaviors that we were seeing in these same clips that the, that the observers were um, describing. And they were either of the focal dolphin themselves, like the individual dolphin, or they were describing a particular group of dolphins. So my God, about your eyes, lots and lots of behaviors. Okay, it's gone now. <laughs> and um, we split these um, different behavioral events into sort of categories. And um, that is helpful for later. You'll see where it fits in later. So. So just keep keep following along with me. <laughs> so what we so let's just go through some of the stats because this is kind of what makes the QBA work. So um, <clears throat> I've I've made it lots I've made it pretty with lots of diagrams. Um, so oh my gosh yes, <laughs> when you have observers writing down lots and lots of individual words, they 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 come up with a lot of them. So I had to measure six thousand lines individually by hand and um, that I calculated it, it turned out to be about 75 meters, <laughs> which is, as you can see, quite a long distance and measuring them in 12 and a half centimeter increments. Um, all very, uh, sorry, there's someone in my chat, sorry. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so what we did, so what I did was took all of these measurements by hand and then fed all of that per word into a data matrix. And then that created, um, so we took all of that data, feed it, fed that into 
um, a statistical program that is quite complicated, but <laughs> I will do my best to um, whittle this down. So what we wanted to do basically was taking all of these different all of these different words and all these different measurements, what this statistical program does is it kind of measures the distance between each of the words for each of the, each of the different observers. And it creates what we call a consensus profile. So it's almost like netting together the best fit model for, for all of these words and measurements together. Now, um, <clears throat> what that does is it generates something called but the, the technique is called, or the analysis is called generalized Procrustes analysis. And what that generates is something called the Procrustes statistics. And that essentially, that best fit model accounted for 74% of, of the variation there. So what we have is this best fit model. And then what happened was the um, program took all of these, took these 10 observers profiles and randomized them a hundred different times. And it, it basically did a comparison, a t-test comparison between our best fit model and, these, um, and the mean of all of these different hundred random profiles. And what we came up with was something that was nicely significant. So it basically shows that our best fit model actually kind of works. And then what we next go on to, so we've got our best fit model. And then <clears throat> we've got our different sort of, um, what are they called? Dimensions of variation. <laughs> and then what we want to do is we want to basically take, take this and condense it down to be able to use the most effective uh, like dimensions to, um, create something that's a little bit more uh, digestible. So I know it's quite, it, it is quite um, complicated, but so what we've got here, so we've got the variance of our model that's explained here. And then our dimensions are, our three main dimensions are captured here. So they're the ones that explain the most sort of expression of, of the animals. Right, so what do we have next? So we've got our three dimensions that we picked out. And then what we need to do is that we need to plot those onto word charts. So we need to kind of combine the things. We need to combine um, these dimensions with the words that everyone's come up with. So we can actually kind of make sense of what they're saying. Da, da, da. So <clears throat> what we've got, so we've got our dimensions, we've got our first, We've got our first dimension here. Oh, why my mouse is jumping. Right, so we've got our first dimension here, second dimension there, first dimension here, third dimension here. Now, this is just one observer's word chart. So the statistical program takes these models, spits out some word charts. So for each individual observer, these, these dimensions of expression are modeled against each individual observer's words. So you can see um, this all pieces together. It's like a really big puzzle. <laughs> You'll see it, don't worry. Um, so the highest correlating um, words sort of fit up the top and the bottom. So for here, for this one observer along dimension one, they can see that the words that they've picked that are most kind of poignant, are energetic, excited, and then at the bottom, they'd be considered bored or calm or whatever. So that's quite enough of that. What we need, so I talk about dimensions and axes. What we need to do is, is label them and give them meaning. So for all of these, for all of these words and all these charts, um, what we needed to do was for each observer, we needed to basically rank, <clears throat> we needed to list all of the words and then we needed to rank the highest number of, a, well, the, the, the words that occurred in the highest number. And because lots of the observers came up with the same types of words for what they were seeing, which is, you know, great. And 
um, what we did what we did was um, the for each of the dimensions. So we had three dimensions for each of the dimensions at the top and at the bottom. We took the three highest correlating or the the words that occurred the most frequently, um, which were the words that were the most highest correlated along each dimension and then they served as the labels for our axes that we can then plot everything else against again it will make sense <laughs> Dun -ba -dun. okay so whew. we've got our axis labels now and then what we also have in the background that i was doing was i was finding or, or basically um, with these same axis labels, the behaviors that then I was recording. So from that big old ethogram, um, we basically wanted to correlate those same behaviors with those same axis labels. So we wanted to see not only where individual words were coming, um, were, were being plotted along these axis labels. We wanted to see where the behaviors of those dolphins were also being plotted against, where those words would also sit. So there's a nice little table of all the various sort of significant correlations. I won't go into this too much because there's, it, it, I explain it nicely in, a, in, a, in the next slide, but here are some of our significant correlations and you can see We've got our three dimensions. We've got our top labels at the top and bottom um, for our different dimensions. And then here are some of the most sort of significantly correlating behaviors. But this is what it starts to look like when you piece it all together. Badam. <laughs> so I'm just going to sit here for a little bit because there's, there's enough to pick apart. So we've got our first dimension, which is looking at more of the kind of activity of the dolphins. So we've all come up with energetic, active and excited. And then towards the bottom, we've got calm, calm, or uh, looking more at the kind of mood that they might be in. Um, <clears throat> so at the one end, we've got happy, playful, calm. And then at the other end, we've got frustrated, aggressive, and annoyed. Now, what we could see was the categories of the different behaviors that we had could clump together along where these sort of chart, basically along this chart. So <clears throat> if we've got animals that are you know, behaving energetically, for example, if they are porpoising, um, so they're sort of, you know, jumping up and down or, or, you know, literally going through the water, that to observers is considered to look very high energy. But it's also looking along here, it's not exactly the most happy, playful looking type of behavior. So it's starting to edge towards more the sort of frustrated type um, well, as I've labeled it, anticipatory type behaviors I'll all go into in a bit more detail. We've got here with um, clusters of aggressive types of behaviors that correlate to observers perceiving these animals as being quite frustrated and aggressive. And then down here, we've got clusters of um, object interactions. So all the animals are sort of. Um, carrying objects or looking at objects, interacting with objects. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's see. So in our anticipatory one, we've got quite a wide variety of um, sort of expressions of what we would call anticipatory type behavior. So um, spy hopping, for example, where the animal is going to be sort of popping up and down looks quite high energy, but it's also can, looks a little bit more playful. Um, and you can see the difference between spy hopping compared to something like porpoising. So that's the first two dimensions. The next one, so we just took, so let's say, okay, so we wanna look at um, circle C, which is all the object interaction. This is what I found really, really interesting. 
So on the second dimension, it didn't really do much. There wasn't really there wasn't really a variation or much of a variation between sort of, you know, the animals looking a bit more frustrated compared to happy. It sort of clusters around the middle, around a sort of relatively neutral zone. However, when we look at our third dimension, which is considered unwilling, nervous, shy at the one end and at the other end, the animals are perceived to be focused or engaged. Um, this object interaction section suddenly spreads out a lot more over that dimension, which is really, really cool. Um, <clears throat> so for example, when we're looking at the animal that's, or the, the behavior of ball tossing, um, those animals were perceived as being really focused, engaged, significantly so. And that was very obvious to the observers. Um, whereas down here, if the, if the animal was simply just looking at the object, that was considered a little differently to observers. So, you know, whether that is a, a sign of boredom, we don't, again, we can't directly tell. Um, but it's definitely more of that sort of calm, slightly more subdued way of being, way of expression compared to really hyper-focused, really curious, engaged. And up at the top, we've got our um, anticipatory behavior again. So um, at, on this particular dimension, what we've got is, it's, it's interesting how it kind of unearths some of the nuances in how, um, anticipation is also seen by observers. So we've got here like dynamic swimming. So it's basically where the dolphins are going all over the place. To observers that was perceived as being quite nervous. Um, <clears throat> whereas poor boy sing was a little bit less than before. It was considered a little bit more frustrated or towards that kind of side of things. But here it's, you know, it's still high energy, maybe towards the more sort of nervous end. It's, it, it's you know, it needs a lot more um, validation on this, but it's just interesting to kind of see where we can start to pick apart the essences of, of that behavioral expression. Um, yes, we've also got some others here down here as well. So um, the act of avoiding the trainer, um, I'll show you this in some in another slide, but um, yeah, so the act of actually avoiding the trainer was very much perceived as being quite unwilling and nervous, which was interesting to see. Um, <clears throat> so perceived aggression. What we need to do is we need to fit this in with the behaviors that we saw. So um, in this particular clip, or th these are screenshots of clips, but these I, I wish I could include video, but my computer is too old and <laughs> I could literally not handle it. <laughs> I didn't want to and just invite those kind of technical problems. I just thought, no, 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 I'll do some screenshots. It will be grand. So we have aggressive behavior. Um, as we saw, they kind of all clustered together around that frustrated high energy type um, part of the expression chart. Um, now, what we have here is that both of these individuals were seen really repeatedly jaw clapping at one another. Now, don't forget, the observers didn't have any specific dolphin knowledge, so they could see, so they wouldn't necessarily know that this is a behavior that is an aggressive behavior, but they can see that the way in which those animals are doing it, um, jaw clapping is perceived as being frustrated, annoyed, and acting in an aggressive manner. Right, so well, a bit more on this slide. <laughs> so anticipation is a really interesting one. So um, <clears throat> there are some interesting studies looking at um, welfare and anticipation of dolphins um, under, under managed care and, and how they might serve as a welfare indicator. And what our observers found was that, as, as we saw, the different types of um, anticipatory behavior, or the, the anticipatory behavior was kind of um, picked apart into some different layers. So there were lots of bouts of uh, this kind of dynamic swimming, spy hopping, 
porpoising, also soliciting attention. This was an interesting, <laughs> this was really funny to watch where one of the dolphins was just sort of lying there watching. And then the, the trainers were busy doing another session with other animals and they obviously didn't want to reinforce interacting with this dolphin while it was doing this. But the dolphin was just there slapping its um, pectoral flipper on the water, trying to solicit attention. And it was really funny. <laughs> um, or, or spraying water at the at the trainer. Um, so spy hopping itself. Um, so this animal here was actually spy hopping at the time. That was considered to be more playful um, and a little bit more happy. Um, dynamic swimming, as I said before, this, I haven't got a picture of it on this slide, but um, <clears throat> this was in this was in anticipation of a training session that was about to start, and the dolphins were swimming all over the place, and um, that was perceived as being more nervous. And then the sort of porpoising and, as I said, floating with their one eye above the water, that was actually perceived as being a little bit more frustrated. Um, again, you can't you, you, you can't see exactly how this is because these are only still clip and um, still pictures of the clips. Um, this is a lot more visible when you're seeing the dolphins all moving together, how, the speed they're swimming and and the, the, the way in which they're actually um, behaving. So it's a lot more obvious. So um, I am sorry that I don't have the videos, but um, yeah, that was that was that. So we also have perceived object interaction as well. So um, this was this was actually the instance of ball tossing. Um, technically, I was you know throwing the ball, but the dolphin was actually tossing the ball itself. Um, they were also, in, as I um, said before, uh, interacting with um, environmental enrichment devices as well. <clears throat> but those who so basically the, the dolphins that were as i as i said before um as they were interacting with the objects if they were actually sort of manipulating the object carrying the object or um interacting with an object in this case with a with a person um they were seen as really really focused really engaged and that was very obvious to observers um this dolphin down here um, is, was just, it was part of the enrichment provision and then they had their um, hula hoops and they were just swimming around pretty chill, just looking pretty calm. Um, <laughs> but, you know, they were, they were intent on what they were doing with those objects. Um, and yeah, but any, any time that the observers sort of watched the animal just simply looking at the object, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting insight into how people who don't know animal behavior can, um, perceive something. So it's really important that this is actually validated and, and done properly by, or with, should I say, animal trainers or dolphin trainers and those who work with the animals every day and understand the individual differences between animals. So it's all very interesting just to kind of see how this is picked apart. We also have um, <clears throat> perceived willingness as well. So this is really interesting. This was one of the interesting things for me um, was that, so this particular dolphin, it was a young dolphin. And during this, uh, you know, this happens <laughs> um, as, as animals are taught and they're learning. This particular dolphin was just having an interesting day <laughs> she was just not um yeah she was just sort of eyeing up the trainer sort of turning away a little bit just a little bit unsure uncertain but it was very interesting that this was very this was really easily picked up by our observers um and what this what this did was it showed that oh, actually after this, after I had done this study, um, Isabella Clegg had come out with um, another uh, paper looking at this willingness to participate as a potential welfare indicator. So it's just interesting that as, as a type of behavioral expression, 
it's it, it can be very obvious to people so it can be quite effective to be used as um a welfare indicator so and obviously you know we need to understand and put that into context when you're applying it to animals and how they're actually participating and what sessions they're in etc but it was just very interesting that it supported that particular piece of um, literature that came out after so where does this actually fit in how is it relevant <clears throat> so this is a very preliminary study um, it showed really great potential in helping us understand and describe um, emotional expression this i have to be very clear about this all the things that i was doing none of this is a direct welfare assessment of the animals that i was looking at or videoing in these different facilities you know we we cannot make any sort of claims about what it is that we were what it is that we were witnessing and even though observers came up with all these different terms it is not a direct reflection of the experience that these animals are necessarily having day to day etc but you know we need to be able to you know, animals are animals and they're all experiencing different emotions and different things anyway so it's important that we can still recognize and demonstrate a wide variety of emotions um what this also does though is it you know when we're looking at things like um <clears throat> enrichment provision so giving animals different objects etc um we this this is quite interesting because it can it can help highlight potential areas where we can look at more critically the type of provisions that we're giving to these animals and see whether okay well maybe um we're trying out this particular um, enrichment device how are the animals actually kind of um interacting with it not just are they interacting with it but you know are they interested in it are they more frightened of it are they really excited about it you know it helps us understand and put into context the type of um it, it helps us measure the success of different devices or or um things that we're giving to these animals so that's an interesting type of thing that we could look forward in the future to as well you know as i said way back at the beginning of my um of my presentation you know where we were looking at um, QBA as a way of looking at different uh, housing environments for different animals or um, you know, different relationships with with people, etc. You know, it's it's all it can all fit into that. You can make a very tailored approach to their welfare. As I said before in the previous slide, it supports a recently validated welfare indicator of the willingness to participate. Um, which I was so happy with. <laughs> I was really excited to when this paper came out. I was like, oh my God, amazing. Um, but then basically what we what we need to do is, as I said, because this isn't a direct welfare assessment, we need to develop this more and validate it as an indicator so that it can be more effectively used and then hopefully one day maybe integrated into any potential um, welfare frameworks that are currently in development. Um, there's several different ones. Obviously, we've got the Seawell one that's, you know, it, they're always being um, worked on, developed, improved, just tested more. Um, so, you know, one day it would be really great to have it as um, as a, as a uh, an effective thing that could be slotted in or, or contribute to other welfare assessments of the animals. Why is this important? Obviously, it always, always, always comes back to the animals. So there's a reason why we want to do welfare assessment, and that's because we want to make sure that the animals are looked after the best that they can. There is a growing demand from the zoo from zoo professionals to to have these kinds of scientific tools to objectively measure welfare. You know that again, it's such a new new field. Or I say it's a new field. It's it's. There's, there's a real explosion and demand for this research within zoos and aquariums and it's really really cool we just literally have to catch up with that demand and and, and effectively implement it so there is a real demand there and it's obviously in it's in the interest of of the trainers to be able to um understand what they're doing and how to uh, you know, always improve and tweak what they're doing so that you know they can continue to provide that quality of life and that that life that's worth living for those animals which they've committed themselves to so um yeah that's 
oh yeah it's all it's all really exciting in the field of marine mammal welfare so if we recap what our original aims of our study were so do the observers agree on dolphin expression from the videos what we found was yes we had a, a nicely significant consensus profile or our best fit model that worked for our observers so they do agree on what they were seeing do these expressions correlate with behaviors yes they do we found several significant correlations with those known clusters of dolphin behaviors or clusters of known dolphin behaviors sorry so we had the anticipation anticipatory behaviors we had the object interactions and then we also had the aggressive behaviors um so yes that was rather good and thirdly do these correlations help us gain understanding in dolphin expression yes so um as i said uh, these different categories of behaviors. Um, <clears throat> it, was, it, it was just interesting to be able to pick apart the nuances and see where these different types of behaviors can fit within that sort of emotional spectrum. And it's just helpful to understand and we can yeah, learn to pick apart this more. So oh, with all that, <laughs> I just wanted to say, Special thank you to um, Sabrina and Francoise and the facilities that were also involved. I'm more than happy to shout them out. I just didn't include them today for a very specific reason. More than happy to do that afterwards if they're happy for me to do that. Um, but thank you, thank you. Without them, this literally wouldn't have happened to my observers. And this was actually financed as part of a scholarship that I had. So that was awesome. And of course, thank you, Dolphin Communication Project, Kathleen, Kel. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for inviting me onto this webinar. So yeah, awesome. That is me, you guys. Let's let's um take it back. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Emma. We appreciate that very much. Um, as we get to questions, I am just going to um, give some folks a wrap up from the DCP end. Mm -hmm. um, so if you joined late uh, to the live program and you want to catch the beginning, you can find all of our recorded webinars on our website. Just look under that education tab and you will find webinars. They're also on our YouTube channel dolphin communication project and we will link as well to emma's youtube channel um, emma's deep dives awesome. also um this was a dcp deep dive um our programs are most second and fourth thursdays at one o'clock eastern we'll probably take a pause in the summer and then hopefully start up again in the fall our dolphin lessons are geared towards a younger audience, and those are generally the first and third Tuesdays. Um, so not next Tuesday, but um, the first Tuesday in May, uh, you can join us for a dolphin lesson with Dr. Kathleen, uh, who will be in Roatan for a fun Q&A session. And then if you still haven't gotten enough of dolphin information, you can check out our podcast, The Dolphin Pod, um, and that's available for free on our website or wherever you get your podcasts. And then lastly, we wouldn't be a good nonprofit if we didn't give a plug for how you can support us. Um, so we are happy to provide these programs for free, these webinars, um, but of course we rely on the support of our members and um, other folks. So you can adopt a wild dolphin, you can become a member, um, you can actually join us in the field. We are recruiting for um, a Bimini program at the moment in July if folks are feeling safe to travel. So if you're interested in seeing that side of DCP's research, uh, stay in touch. All the info is there on our website, email us, stay in touch via social media. And with that, um, we can get to some questions. Um, so feel free, uh, we don't have a lot of time for questions, but if you haven't submitted yours and you have one, feel free, we'll be uh, monitoring that chat. Um, there is one. Emma, we had a, a, oh, go ahead, Kathleen. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I didn't know, Cal, if, if you had it, but um, Emma, when you identified this, the uh, 
10 students who mm -hmm. watched the video and did everything. So it's kind of a two part question is, mm -hmm. um, first, they were all naive to dolphins, so they weren't familiar with dolphin behavior. So do you think that the results might have been different had they all been familiar with dolphin behavior, not necessarily trainers, but maybe uh, either have either, well, yeah, either trainers or researchers or other folks who are familiar with them versus not. And so then that's the first part. And then the second part is, do you know if your coders might have had preconceived notions about dolphins? So either views about dolphins in managed care or views about dolphins in the wild or views about them with respect to anything in a history. And how might you control for that confound in terms of the responses that you would be getting from them with respect to how they would classify certain behaviors? That's an interesting set of questions. <clears throat> the cool thing about QBA is that it's based on, it's basically, because it's based on the measurements and the, and the distances between the words and where they sit. It's, it's, you can, you can use QBA to do a number of things. So actually, in, in relation to your first question, do I think that there'd be a difference if we had people who weren't naive to dolphins? Um, to, to see the range of, do, to see the range of emotion, uh, sorry, to see the range of behaviors and the different types of um, um, expressions that come from those behaviors, I think people know, people know their animals, <laughs> but they, you know, they're, they're, they're taught, it's, hmm, it's a good, hmm, <laughs> do I think there'd be a difference? Possibly, but I think what, I, I actually didn't want necessarily to have people who were, as you say, having pre preconceived understanding of, um, managed care um, as, as the starting group, because these people already knew about animals and, and were welfare focused, they weren't necessarily at either end of this kind of spectrum. They weren't people that were so invested in the animals themselves and almost sort of self-protectionist. And they also weren't um, you know, super anti-captivity people, otherwise they probably wouldn't have really been doing the master's degree. You had some people who are more animal rights based, but they understood the concept of welfare and why everything was there. So they could understand why this whole thing was happening. So they were, and they were all, you know, scientists. So they were doing it as, as objectively as they could. Um, in terms of, in terms of whether that actually makes a, a difference, there was a study that Francoise had done looking at, I think it was, um, observers who were in different groups so you had people who were animal liberationists doing a QBA study looking at the same um video clips as a group of farmers and they found that actually the 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 words they were using was slightly more um ex just a little bit different but the way they fitted together in that consensus model they fitted in the same areas as the um as, as one another um, along those consensus dimensions. Cool. So it's, it's, it's really interesting. There's so much more to pick apart. You could do this all day with all these different scenarios and situations and see what you can come up with. Um, I'm going to throw out another question that I'm, I'm sort of adapting a little bit uh, from someone's question. And I found it interesting because I, uh, collect data here in Bimini on wild dolphins, and it is constantly an issue of sample size. <laughs> there is never enough. Um, in this study, did you feel that you had, or, or how did you feel about the amount of dolphins and observations, the, the clips you had, um, and the number of observers? Did you feel that they it was kind of the bare minimum functional? It was just the right sample size for this type of study? So the sample size of the dolphins isn't necessarily an issue. There was, there was, there were lots of dolphins, which was great. And that was, you know, we, I, the main thing is that you needed to have enough range of expression 
that was the thing. So there's no point having clips of just all dolphins behaving in, you know, an aggressive manner or just swimming around as, as they do, you know, there's, there's, we need enough variation. You could get that with um, a smaller sample size of dolphins, um, but it just so happened that we had lots of dolphins and lots of variation with that. So, you know, individual dolphin, it, and this is a thing, you know, we can't, we can't make um, claims on any one animal or any group of animals. It needs more validation to see, you know, whether maybe there are more differences in variation, depending on how many more dolphins you look at. Um, but in terms of observers, I mean, it was a master study. So, you know, having 10 observers was good enough. Um, you could always have more. That would be really helpful, <laughs> hopefully, as you move forward. Um, having, having enough specifically relevant people to do the kind of validation that it's required it would be essential. So it was good enough for what we could create and, and demonstrative enough. Um, but yeah, as you move forward to do it more, you ideally would like to do it with more rele um, relevant people. Thank you. Um, this question came from a viewer. Um, do you think that the dolphins themselves being in managed care and in the presence of people all the time has a big influence on, I'm, I'm thinking maybe they mean on, on the dolphin's behavior um, and would the results, would the behaviors observed be very different from what you might observe in the wild? That's a really interesting question. Um, when you say in the wild, I mean around around other people or around, or just, you know, you could, you could look at it with drone footage. That would be really cool. And <laughs> um, that's a whole different other thing. Jason, I know you're on the call. <laughs> um, but I mean, this- uh, I, moment, I interpret it more maybe as just there because they're in the presence of people so often, um, hmm. as opposed to if it was just an hour of their day being observed in the wild. And, kind of I filling think, in the gaps on that question. I think, well, because at the moment, this is this is more applicable and most relevant to animals that are within managed care. So I don't, so if you wanted to have a look at wild dolphins and how they might um, have their expressions, what you'd, you'd the, the behaviors of the dolphins don't necessarily differ between wild and in managed care facilities, you know, they still exhibit the same behaviors. Um, it's just um, a question of, yeah, basically just whether those differences, where am I going with this? Um, there, there, shouldn't, there shouldn't really be a difference, but in terms of it on a daily basis, you know, interacting with humans and, and having a different type of daily schedule what what you see still look out for <laughs> yeah what you yeah. see in in, in no spending time look... searching for food yeah exactly what you see mm -hmm. in managed care is going to be very different but if we're the ones who are directly responsible for those animals we need to know how our actions have an impact on on their welfare and that goes for the environment that they're in the things that they've given and that is you know, fundamentally different from the daily lives of those animals that are in the wild. But I didn't actually include this in here, but you know, it would be really cool if you could actually do this assessment on wild dolphins, because you know, we do have a massive impact uh, as humans on wild dolphins. So, you know, whether we are things like ecotourist boats and swimmers and other and, and all these other things, you know, they do have an impact on wild dolphin behavior. So that would be interesting to see as well. And whether that would look different, we don't know. We can only do it. We can only tell if we do it. So <laughs> we actually try studying it, so. Well, I think if it's if it's all right, we'll sneak in two more questions. I have a few, but we'll we'll get to, to two of them. One, because you just kind of segued to that. Mm -hmm. um, do you think there are potential implications of this study in the whale and dolphin watching industry, as in, possibly teaching captains and naturalists what behaviors to look out for and appropriate actions uh, to take to reduce the stress of the boat presence. 
It's an interesting one. So when you're doing when you're doing an assessment of these animals under care, you know, you're taking into you're, you're taking into account so many different factors um, that really we can control. You know, if you're doing a welfare assessment, you're met, you're, you're, you should be measuring things like um, your body condition and the provisions that you're giving. So the food and and you understand the direct environment that they're in, the kind of training schedule they have that all fit that all has to fit in with making a, 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 um, a meaningful assessment on their emotional state when you're in the wild and you're on a boat as, as you said in an earlier question you know you might only be seeing those animals for however long they might be popping up for it's like when when I had the the pictures of the of the animals on the screen you're only seeing a snapshot of what that animal might be experiencing. And it's a whole different challenge to be able to take into account all those factors that might be influencing those wild animals that we might genuinely not have a clue about because we've only just waltzed into their environment, seen them for a little bit, and then they've either swam away or we've driven them off. So it would it would have to be approached in a very um calculated way I think you'd have to really think about what you were doing um but it'd be really cool I think it would be really quite necessary to see how we can see that emotionally if there's an impact that we're having on the animals in the wild and hopefully all of the operators in those um tour industries are taking into account and trying to do better you know each each year if you will or, or as we gain knowledge and having um, better guidelines, better practices to um, not just work on the kind of old assumptions, but integrate in new information. Absolutely. We can only improve and grow if we you know, implement and understand and accept new information that is given to us. <laughs> that is the nature of science. <laughs> um, so the last question, I think will be short, um, and, and then we can wrap up. And I don't know the facilities that you did your study at and what the history of their individual dolphins is. Um, but the question was, did you see any differences or did you look at differences between rescued or wild caught dolphins versus those that were born in managed care? It's a good question. I don't know the answer to that because at the time I didn't know what I, we, I, I couldn't identify the animals themselves. I was only there in each facility for three days a piece. So there were 36 different, 20, 26 or 36 different dolphins. I, I didn't know which ones were which. I was sort of left to my own devices. So no, I can't answer that question mm. really. But that, I guess, makes you less biased as well. To, yeah, absolutely. To be observing I, I, the, the behaviors without knowing the histories. Yeah, I think for the, I, I honestly don't know. I think there's probably, I, I can't comment. I think there's, there might be a mix. I don't know. <laughs> but well, given the fact that the, there's, the oldest dolphin was 52, she would have been from the wild. But um, mm -hmm. I, I wasn't able to identify them and, and as individual animals. So that wasn't factored mm -hmm. into um, the variations of expression. Gotcha. And a reminder to all of our listeners that there's also always more questions to ask um, and, and more variables and details to consider when you are studying uh, dolphins or any animal and science in general. Um, so with that, thank you everyone who was joining us live. Thank you to everyone who is listening to this as a recording. And most especially, thank you to Emma uh, for leading that very engaging talk. And uh, we wish you all the best and hope that we will have you back again. Thank you so much for having me. I really, yeah, that was awesome. Thank you so much. And I really enjoyed asking, answering the questions as well. Great. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.